Welcome to the Forum, the BBC's global exchange of ideas. I'm Tim Marlow. This week, rewilding. What happens when abandoned land, both inner city and depopulated countryside, is left to find its own way? Does it mark the end of human civilization, or could it provide ecological solutions for the survival of the planet? Or is it just another lucrative idea to attract eco-tourists? Joining me in the Forum studio this week to consider these questions are environmentalist and journalist George Monbiot, from the Netherlands, conservationist and managing director of Rewilding Europe, Franz Scapers, and from the US, Joe Nassauer, professor of landscape architecture at the University of Michigan. First of all, just to get us started, I'd, I'd like to ask each of you briefly to summarise what the essence of rewilding means to you. Joan first. Mm, from my perspective, rewilding encourages us to acknowledge how fundamentally changed the planet is by human activities and to think about what functions of nature we want to ensure for the future of the planet and act accordingly. George? It's a mass restoration of ecosystems, but it's also a rewilding of our own lives, a, a re-enchantment, a rediscovery of the wonder and delights of nature, but also of the adventures that we can have in nature. And Franz? For me, it's a, a new appreciation of the concept of the wild. Rewilding, I think, embraces a new conservation vision for Europe, where we let nature do its own job much more than we used to do. And we will be astonished and surprised by the resilience that nature has and shows us some of its forces when it's allowed to come back. So there's plenty of overlap there. It's very interesting. You all have personal perspectives too. Let's start with, with you, George Monbiot. You're an award-winning writer and journalist. You've travelled extensively searching out new experiences of wildlife and, and wild landscapes and people who live in some of the wildest places on Earth. And your book, Feral, Searching for Enchantment on the Frontiers of Rewilding, should perhaps give us a clue that you consider that there's something mystical or even magical about allowing the wild to re-enter human experience. I'd say you're usually an analytical writer, but there seems to be an intensely personal angle to this, as if you've discovered the hunter-gatherer in yourself. I'm thinking particularly when there's a moment in the book where you, 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 um, you were spearfishing in Wales. It seemed to me to be a moment of epiphany. Is that right? It, it was an extraordinary and completely unexpected thing that I, I actually found very disorienting. I didn't know how to assimilate it. I could neither dismiss it nor make it part of my ordinary life. But what, what happened was I was looking for flounders, stalking down a tidal channel in an estuary with a trident and concentrating very hard, trying to spot the flounders hidden under the sand. They're very hard to see. And I became more and more engaged in what I was doing until I became as flexed and as focused as a heron. I felt almost as if I were a wild animal. And then suddenly this extraordinary thing happened where I became possessed, and I think that's the right word to use, by the absolute conviction that I'd done this a thousand times before, that I knew that work as well as I knew my way home. And I think what I experienced there was a part of the vestigial psyche, a suite of behaviour of the same kind that makes us instinctively care for our children or makes us leap over a five-foot wall if a truck is just about to plough us down, which was left over from a time when that was absolutely essential to our survival. And I felt I had a glimpse then of something that was a, a very intrinsic and important part of myself, but that was a completely unexercised faculty. So the, the wild part of you within, and you, it's something you describe as genetic memory, is that right? Mm, yes, yes, that's right. And, 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 and something which was immensely thrilling uh, to discover, but also to experience. It was like an extraordinary drug. And once I'd had it, I just wanted it again and again. It's interesting, your eyes are on fire at the moment. I'm glad you haven't got a trident in your hand. <laughs> um, it, it's very uh, both poetic and compelling. But what's the connection between this idea and the idea about vast tracts of land um, that have been abandoned by humans, rewilding them. Mm -hmm. Well, part of my interest in rewilding came from an interest in trying to rewild myself, I suppose. that I lived a very exciting life in my young adulthood and um, got into an awful lot of scrapes in many different parts of the world. And then I came back and I realised that after a while, loading the dishwasher had become quite an interesting task because like, life had sort of diminished and diminished until it seemed like a small and shuffling thing. And, and 
you know, okay, we've, we've gained a great deal from pursuing safety and security and from knowing what comes next, which has been almost a principal task of humankind. But we've really lost something too, and we've lost that richness and rawness of experience. And it seems to me that one way we can bring some of that back without sacrificing the amazing things that we've gained in terms of longevity, in terms of human health, in terms of security, is to bring back some of the excitement of the natural world and, and to bring back some of the, the, the wonderful animals that we've lost, the forests that we've lost, the self-willed, self-motivated ecosystems. I mean, one of our problems, I feel, is that everything is so ordered and regulated and scheduled. Um, and that includes, in many places, the natural world, where we have these management plans, where we decide for the next 20 years exactly how long the grass is going to grow here and what the composition of the shrubs over there is going to be and what species we have and what species is we don't that's not how the natural world works but it's also not what resonates with some of the things inside us that find great excitement and wonder in nature and for me a lot of the wonder in nature is about the natural processes it's not just about what species are there but it's about all the dynamic and unexpected and serendipitous relationships between them someone listening might say this is wonderful but it's still quite self-indulgent um how does it benefit humanity more broadly? Well, of course, there is a self-indulgent component because it is wonderful, it is delightful, it is enchanting. And what's wrong with that? Why shouldn't we all be allowed to experience that? But at the same time, there are a lot of more material gains from it. For instance, uh, we suffer from an appalling cycle of floods and droughts in Britain, as many other countries do, and that's greatly exacerbated, and in some cases caused, by the fact that our watersheds are almost bare. There are no trees in them to absorb the water and to release it slowly and to flatten out that cycle of flood and drought. Similarly, we have big problems with soil erosion. But we also, I think there's tremendous potential for rural communities who are losing their livelihoods because the traditional means of making a living in most rural areas are disappearing very fast to find a whole new means of making a livelihood through ecotourism and all the other things associated with um, allowing the wild to return and bringing back the big beasts which are so attractive and appealing to people. Franz, how does this resonate with your experience in rewilding other parts of Europe? Is, the, is there this personal enchantment that's driving it or is it a more collective idea? I think um, you know introducing this this whole idea, which is very new to Europe, I have to say, and um, we have seen people changing their thinking. Very traditional foresters that suddenly realize, on a personal level, how he has been working. So it's very much about a different way of thinking, a mind shift. You know, rewilding starts in your mind, and if you start looking different at areas where we are used, as George very well explained, to control and manage and to cut and to mow and to burn and to shoot and to prune and whatever people do in nature. Stepping back instead of being an active manager and controller, more become a visitor and watch and enjoy and see it. Joan, we'll come to the urban dimension later in the programme, which is something you've been looking at. But just more broadly, in America, do these ideas reverberate? Because I'm thinking in Yellowstone National Park, for example, it was the wolves reintroduced there. And there's been a, a major impact a kind of um, trickle-down effect, if you like, with these big predators on, on, the, on the whole ecosystem. That's true. And in the United States, about 40% of the land area is public land. And much of that area is managed as wildland. Not all of it, but much of it. So the whole sense of scale and of legacy of wildness is quite different. But nonetheless, there's a kind of unifying theme, which is that even in the very large areas of uh, linked federal lands in the Rockies, which includes the Yellowstone National Park, boundary management is an issue. No matter how large the patch that is wild, on its edges, the relationship between tended land and expectations for different kinds of tending, whether it's uh, raising livestock, cattle, ranching as it is near Yellowstone, or other forms of tending, those different cultural expectations between wildness and more tended landscapes must be resolved because the environmental functions, including the wildlife that uses habitat, very seldom respect boundaries. So the cultural expectations on either side of these edges between wild areas need to be adjusted. 
The, the interesting thing about the word rewilding is, is, is it's only a few decades old and it first entered the dictionary in 2011, but it's already got loads of definitions. And, and it was mm. used to begin with to describe the release of captive animals back into the wild. And that meaning persists, but then it became also about the, the reintroduction of species into places where those species had become extinct. And then it became about the whole ecosystem and, and restoring ecosystems. And already it's begun to take on social meanings. So the rewilding of human beings and the sort of release of children back into a wider landscape when they've become so locked in their own bedrooms. And so rewild the child is, is one of the slogans you hear sometimes. Um, and it's one of those words which kind of needed to be invented because it describes a lot of things we've been reaching towards but haven't really been able to explain to ourselves until that word came along. And for me, that was a big thing, because I, I knew there was something I was trying to put my finger on, and then I stumbled across this word rewilding, and I thought, that's it. But the key issue, of course, and Jones touched upon it, uh, tending, control, order, the kind of balance between human involvement and letting nature take its course. I mean, it's a specific example, Wales, where you used to live, you're very down, I think, it's a fair, fair comment, on um, the, the decimation of land by sheep grazing, as you describe it. And in a way, your solution is to stop that because it's subsidised. And in a way, a lot of farmers will then stop that their livelihoods won't happen. So who tends the landscape? Aren't they the best people placed to look after and to exert some kind of order or control? I, I don't want to get all the sheep farmers off the land. I really don't. I want to see some diversity in land use. And at the moment, in, in Britain, it's amazing. You know, all our uplands are basically grazed to the quick. They are bowling green for contours. There's almost nothing there. The trees have gone. This was once a densely forested landscape. And the weird thing is, and it's interesting, you, you go to the continent of Europe, you find the lowlands are largely bare, but the uplands are largely forested, which is what you'd expect, because that's where the poor, infertile land is. Here, the lowlands are largely bare. The uplands are even barer. And it's this crazy situation which we come to accept as natural, and it's incredibly damaging. But what I want to be able to say to farmers is, look, the subsidies aren't going to last forever. You're totally dependent on them. Hill, hill farms would not exist at all in Britain if it weren't for subsidies, because they, they lose huge amounts of money. So what are you going to do when the subsidies end? Because they will end. People aren't going to put up with them for much longer. 50 billion euros a year you, you, Europe is spending in, in an age of austerity. It's, it's insanity. So what are you going to do? And I think one answer is, look, there's a whole world of opportunity here. If you can get people to come and pay big bucks for it, to, to come and see exciting wildlife, which we don't yet have, which is good for everybody. We'll come on to that in, in more detail in a minute. I just want, there's something I just want to pick up on, which is that one of the arguments around the ten, letting that happen in, in, in the uplands of places like Wales is there's a tradition there. Mm -hmm. Now, you have this concept of shifting baseline syndrome, and the argument is it was a tradition, but it's only a tradition of 200 years or 500 mm -hmm. years. Just, just explain that a, yes. a little further. Well, shifting baseline syndrome, it was um, coined by the fisheries biologist Daniel Pauly, and, and the idea is that the state of the natural world in our childhood is considered by us to be natural and normal. And so we say, oh, things have got a bit worse since then. We need to get back to what that was. But that itself was a situation of enormous loss and depletion. But that becomes our baseline. And with every generation, the baseline shifts a little bit further along the spectrum of degradation. And what shifting baseline does is to challenge us to say, actually, let's look a bit further and, and let's look not just backwards but also forwards what, what could the landscape be what could live here uh, rather than just being confined to locked within the last hundred years as we always are so well this is the way it is so this is the way it ought to be we, we can get past that and say we could have a diversity of uses and some of them could be really really exciting they won't be the same as they were in the past no ecosystem will be the same but you know, we reintroduce some of the missing elements, the trees, the big animals, and then we stand back and see what happens. Franz, what do you, do you think of shifting baseline syndrome? Is it, is it just pragmatism, or do you agree with George? No, it's it's absolutely uh, uh, true. And um, if I can make a comparison with mainland Europe and how we view our wildlife, for instance, you know, we have, because hunting is everywhere, animals have become shy, diurnal animal species have become nocturnal species and we speak with a lot of people foresters hunters landowners all over europe and what you hear constantly is saying yeah we have natural numbers and if you then start asking then it turns out that i mean these 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 numbers and densities of animals are very very low compared to what it could be and 
I sometimes make the comparison with the big oceans, which are emptied by, by fishing, and that happened on the land already. We have to realize that the whole of Europe, hunting is everywhere, even in national parks, and there is no single place where we can actually see natural densities of wildlife as it could be sustained by a larger landscape and where people are not interfering and where the species are there that should be there, and, you know, the native species, and where we can see the, their interactions. Well, in a sense, that's what your organisation, Rewilding Europe, is trying to do. You're currently yeah. the managing director of it. And, yes. I mean, in a sense... You've, you've given us a, a strong flavour of what it's about. I, I think one of the aims is to create a million hectares of new wildlands across Europe by yeah. 2020. Um, you mentioned areas that you're working in. I think there's at least six areas. Um, just explain where they are and actually what is happening there. Yeah, so uh, we have showcases, areas. At, they all um, are at least 100,000 hectares. Many, many of them are more, which we would like to develop and, and as, as ins inspirational showcases of how rewilding could happen in practice. They are in def different ge geographical regions, different ecosystems, countries ranging from uh, uh, Spain, Portugal, Croatia, Romania, Bulgaria, Italy, Poland, Germany. Uh, we're working on new areas in Sweden. And these areas were nominated actually by local organizations that believe this could be a future for their area where indeed land abandonment is happening, where wildlife is coming back. Why, why and, uh, is the land abandonment? Why, just explain why that phenomenon is happening. The main two drivers for land abandonment in Europe is that young people uh, move to cities and they want a modern life, go to university, have an iPhone, make friends and, and go to cool cafes and so on. So young people are leaving behind their parents and grandparents. And the other main sort of driver of land abandonment is that a lot of these areas, when they were occupied by people, when the European population was expanding, people went into areas where those days you could earn a living with subsistence farming and so on. But now they're, they're really not competitive with modern agriculture anymore. How key then is, is, is agriculture and agricultural policy to rewilding? I mean, it sounds like it's, it's a pragmatic response to um, a, a, yes. the, the failure of agriculture in certain areas. Yeah, well, we, we mainly work in areas where agriculture is, is leaving and, and where, so we're not, we're not, we're not competing with agriculture in areas which are very fertile. We are focusing now with our first initiatives in those areas where these changes are all happening. So those who say, one, sorry, Joan, you come in. Yeah. Yes, I was just going to say that one uh, aspect of that that relates to rewilding as a concept is that these changes of land cover from cultivated land to habitat can have many different kinds of environmental benefits, in particular clean water. And so it gets us to once again acknowledging the degree to which even areas that might look wild in the future are part of larger social systems as well and can produce a, a whole array of social values. So this is the idea, is it that introduced there, say, megafauna, for example, that in the end, uh, the whole ecology of a particular place, um, different species return, different uh, 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 plants, trees grow, the whole issue on flooding, natural cl cleaning of water and so on, there's social benefits to humanity, but it's just a question of being able to show that. Yes, and, and, and that's, that, that is one very important aspect of it. But I don't want the other aspects to be lost. I don't want to suggest this is purely a mechanical process for um, delivering benefits to humanity, material benefits to humanity, because they're all the immaterial, spiritual benefits, if you like, as well, plus the wonderful thing of seeing the natural world recovering. I think it has very major psychological impacts to see that things aren't all going in one direction. We're so used to the ecosystem being degraded everywhere. To see things going in the opposite direction, to see things getting better, I think that's mm -hmm. tremendously important for humanity. What about the examples of, of, of species that are returning? Franz, what, what, what species are returning to Europe? We have seen tremendous increases in numbers and distribution of species like wolf, brown bear, red deer, roe deer, wild boar, um, some of the bird species, eagles, vultures, uh, storks, uh, pelicans, flamingos, and uh, that, of course, brings both opportunities and challenges because in a lot of these areas, you know, talk, let's, let's look at the wolf, which is now really getting into the west of Europe. You know, Germany has already a dozen packs. There's lots of pups born this year, and wolves have already gone into Denmark, coming into the Netherlands, going into Belgium, France, and we have to 
learn how we can live again with wolves. And um, I want to be very clear to say that rewilding is not just about reusing animals or herbivores or carnivores. It's about yeah, bringing back the natural species that you would expect in an area and uh, make sure that the linkages between herbivores, carnivores, scavengers, that, that the ecosystem is sort of gradually rebuilt. But how so do you respond then to the farming lobby, for, example, for instance, who would say, we've got an increasing population to feed and you're giving over swathes of land uh, to, mm -hmm. to restore it to some past glory? What's your yeah. response to that? Well, you know, the world food production, is, is that's a global issue. It's not like, you know, the people in a certain area produce food for themselves. Maybe that's something we should do much more, by the way. But in the areas we're talking about, those are not the areas where, where the world food production is, is happening. And so that's a mis misunderstanding that there is a competition when it comes to rewilding and food production. And the hunting, you say hunting is still prevalent all over Europe, Franz. And yes. wh why will this not just be a wonderful game park for hunters? <laughs> Yeah, well, hunting is part of the problem when it comes to uh, low numbers of wildlife, very shy animals and so on. So if we want the public to enjoy more our wildlife, you know, hunting also needs to be part of the solution here. And, and we are working and trying to work with hunters um, to see can we create areas, no hunting zones, to make the comparison with the oceans again, no take zones, you know, can we create no take zones in national parks or around them, rewilding areas where we can boost wildlife, we bring animals back where the business model again, turns around from some, some marginal hunting to a destination where you actually can see and enjoy wildlife and where you can discover that a live bear or wolf is 10, 20, 30 times more value than a dead one. So we're working with hunters in a number of areas and they're extremely interested. So is that, is that, happening that is in promising. Is that yeah. happening in America, Joan, where the, where the hunting lobby is pretty powerful? The hunting lo lobby is powerful in America, but I think, I think the landscape context is really fundamentally different in America from in Europe. Um, hearing what Franz and George are saying, it strikes me that much of the work that you are doing now in Europe to adjust uh, local people's expectations about how their landscape should look, how they want them to look, how they use them, in some ways, in some places in America, that work has been done some time ago. We have many studies that show, for example, people uh, enjoy landscapes, get the kind of pleasure that you were talking about, George, in a very different way in landscapes that they expect to look wild or natural, say in the Mountain West, than they do in the cultivated Midwest of the United States. These are both forms of real pleasure different kinds of pleasure in different kinds of nature so that we shouldn't equate being natural as people uh, experience nature with being wild in some more authentic environmental way. These are all very culturally contextual ideas about what nature looks like. Thanks for now to all three of you. We'll be back with more rewilding here on the forum right after the BBC News Summary. Weekends on the BBC World Service. On the forum, we tackle the very big questions of our age and the very small. A nanometer is one billionth of a meter. In the next program, we explore nanotechnology, minuscule probes and sensors invisible to the naked eye. You use special microscopes which detect the object by feeling it because many of these objects are smaller than the wavelength of light. Nanoscience may be about the unbelievably small, but the impact on our lives lives could be huge. Diagnostic devices that are just a few nanometers big that can sense the difference between health and disease. I'm Bridget Kendall and this week I ask a gathering of nanoscientists how their work could change the world. The Forum, Challenges of Nanoscience, online at bbcworldservice.com. Still to come on the Forum, letting nature take its course not just as an ecologically inspired idea in increasingly depopulated rural areas, known as rewilding, but also as part of a programme of social regeneration in urban places and spaces, notably the city of Detroit in the United States. But is this realistic or just a romantic vision? And do residents of some of the most deprived areas of the Western world really want rural wilderness to replace urban jungle? Join us to find out after the news summary. BBC News with Jerry Smith. 
The two candidates in Afghanistan's disputed presidential election have finalized a deal to form a government of national unity three months after voting was completed. A spokesman for one of the candidates, Abdullah Abdullah, told the BBC that he accepted that his rival Ashraf Ghani should be president. In return, Dr. Abdullah will nominate a chief executive with powers similar to those of a prime minister. Crowds of flag-waving Turks in the capital Ankara have welcomed home almost 50 people who've been freed three months after they were taken hostage by Islamic State militants in northern Iraq. They were seized as the Turkish consulate in Mosul in June when the Islamist group overran a large swathe of northern Iraq. Turkey says that 45,000 mainly Kurdish refugees from Syria have crossed the border since it was opened by the Turkish authorities on Friday. The flow of refugees has been prompted by intense fighting between Islamic State militants and Kurdish forces. Britain and France have reached an agreement on how to manage the number of illegal immigrants arriving at the port of Calais. Under the deal, the UK will contribute 15 million euros over three years to help finance new security measures at the port. Increasing numbers of immigrants have been gathering there in the hope of being able to cross over to England. Ukrainian government negotiators and pro-Russian rebels have agreed a nine-point plan to reinforce the current shaky ceasefire in eastern Ukraine. The deal includes an end to offensive operations and the creation of a demilitarized zone. The governing National Party in New Zealand has won a decisive victory in the general election and secured a third consecutive term. With 48% of the vote, the centre-right party may be able to govern alone for the first time since New Zealand adopted proportional representation nearly 20 years ago. BBC News. This is the Forum from the BBC. In today's programme, rewilding the complex and controversial issue of leaving the land to its own devices. But now, time for our 60-second idea to change the world. And this week, it's from environmentalist and journalist George Monbiot. George, you've got just 60 seconds to make your case to us, uh, to me and my two other guests from the Netherlands conservationist Franz Kepers and Joe Nassau, Professor of Landscape Architecture at the University of Michigan. So if you've collected your thoughts, the 60 seconds is yours from now. To what extent it always happened, I don't know. But the story goes that a principle of conflict in ancient Greece was that any ruler declaring war must lead his troops into battle. It's an idea we should revive. Today, the costs of declaring war are too low. When the US and Britain went to war in Iraq in 2003, their leaders could send the young and poor to their deaths while remaining safer than almost anyone at any point in history. In some cases, wars are waged to distract people from domestic problems or as cold political calculations to boost a leader's standing in the polls. But how willing would they be to play that game if they were to find themselves on the front line, preferably with no greater protection than the ordinary soldier receives and had to stay there until the war is over? Isn't this a basic constitutional precaution that any state should take? To defend us against the chicken hawks who strike macho poses but let other people take the risk? How often do you think we'd go to war? Bang on. Franz, do you think that's a good idea? I think it's a great idea, and I'm sure there will be less war started. At least it's, that's what I hope, but... You know, it's, it makes a big difference if you're on the front line yourself instead of being in your sort of ivory tower and making decisions which have a huge impact. Joan, what, what's your response? Oh, as I think about the wars that we are all enduring now, I have great empathy for the people who have to make these very difficult, complex decisions. But I, I like George's idea very much if I think about the people who have strong opinions that we should go to war. George, it's, um, it, it is a really interesting idea, but quite significantly in your book, Feral, you, you sort of recognise and celebrate the violence within yourself, um, you know, your hunting instinct. Aren't human beings naturally violent? We, we do have that in us, and we have a lot of good things in us as well. And it's fascinating how many of the myths that have survived of ancient heroes, everyone from Ulysses to Glosku, from um, Lanlot Khan to Arjuna, all over the world, who fought great monsters, who battled with monsters, which, of course, we did through our evolutionary history. We grew up evolutionarily, in a world of horns and tusks and fangs and claws, and we had tremendous challenges to negotiate. And now we live this very tame, confined life 
and we'd seek outlets for that. And it, well, it's but that amazing, might explain yeah. why leaders irresponsibly, you seem to imply, send us to war, because it's a natural human impulse to mm. want to fight. Mm. Mm. Well, well, possibly. It, but what civilization is all about is containing those impulses and making it possible to live with them. And what I want to do with rewilding is not incompatible with that. It's not trying to get rid of civilization. It's saying, let's find outlets which are not only harmless, but wonderful. Thrilling, delightful. Briefly, Franz and, and Joe, do you think do you think it might help if um, if world leaders were made to spend some time in wild places alone? Yeah, maybe that would help. And I was even thinking, you know, we we had a Dutch astronaut who became a very a big supporter of conservation organisations, and he, he went uh, into space and he looked at Earth from that perspective. And maybe some of these people who make serious decisions about what happens in the world also look at the vulnerability of our planet. And um, I know there's wilderness trails for captains of industry, for politicians, very basic, three days walking just without any luxury and just try and think about what is life about and um, very healing wilderness is very healing Joe? we know that the experience of nature even just being outdoors is very restorative psychologically so yeah. i'd love to have all of our world leaders be very psychologically healthy and ready to make good decisions let's leave it there <laughs> um, now we we've, we've heard about the rewilding of depopulated rural areas but what about urban sites the so-called brownfields that were once covered by industry or vacant city areas that once housed large populations but are now derelict Let's turn to you now, Joan Nassau, Professor of Landscape Architecture at the University of Michigan in the US. Um, part of your work's been to observe what's been happening in the city of Detroit, you know, with its great industrial history as the Motor City. Uh, but now, with the shrinking of that industry, large urban areas are, are being returned to prairie. Joan, I, I think of Detroit, I think of, sort of landmark images and, and, um, and buildings like the Michigan Central Railway Station that's a derelict. But how long is nature taking to take over parts of the city, and, and what does it actually look like? So, just briefly some facts. Half of the residential parcels in Detroit are either vacant or derelict, so ultimately are likely to be vacant to have the structures removed. Uh, the area of those parcels is larger than all of the parks and open space in the city combined. So the whole grain and feeling of the city is completely unlike uh, what it was 50 years ago. However, while on those vacant properties, some of the plants we see look something like what might have existed there 150 or 200 years ago. These are landscapes that are well characterized by a phrase that uh, the Australian ecologist Richard Hobbs coined, which is they are novel ecosystems. So unlike what people are accustomed to seeing in cities that people have difficulty uh, comprehending this. One picture, I guess, that I could paint for you is of a, a block after block of worker housing from uh, the immediate uh, post-war, you know, late 40s to early 60s. These tidy homes that people had for themselves and their families when they worked in the factories but where now uh, it might be randomly, there might be two houses on the block that are still way, well maintained, but the other houses on the block are either burned out from arson, they might be demolished, and uh, volunteer vegetation, these novel ecosystems that can be quite shrubby, depending upon how often the vacant property has been mown, are emerging. and. The reason I describe it that way at the scale of a block is that the size of these pieces is quite small. And yet, at the scale of a single small parcel, think of uh, less than a tenth of a hectare, quite wild within that parcel. Presumably wildlife but, itself returns. What, what, what species are in these small mm, parcels of land? We're, we're seeing white-tailed deer, and that creates these boundary issues um, because white-tailed deer carry some diseases that humans don't want next to them, as, as beautiful as, as these animals can be. There's uh, a substantial pheasant population in Detroit now. And then foxes, raccoons, skunks. Some, there's been some talk about sighting of coyotes, but as far as I know, that's only conversation at this point. But these are just the uh, kind of harbinger of the future when the roughly 10,000 structures that still need to be demolished are demolished and the whole landscape structure of Detroit changes. 
So it is very much an ecological design challenge to make these environments both environmentally friendly, but also in a city that continues to have 700,000 people in it, socially friendly. How do you do that? One of the most important things is to overlay other environmental functions that are fundamental to a city in these, quote, wild places. And the most obvious one that we're working with now is storing rainwater. Detroit is a city that has a long history of releasing polluted sanitary sewer water into the lakes and rivers during big storms. And so if we can hold stormwater on these vacant parcels, that could reduce some of this pollution of fresh water downstream. But most fundamentally, by putting that value on those vacant properties, that value of holding stormwater, we are working to make sure those properties look well cared for. That's the most important part in uh, neighborhoods that are fragmented in these ways. You mean it can't look over wild? It can't, look, it can't reflect the fears that people have of the urban jungle, for want of a better phrase? It's got to look like there's some order or control, otherwise they're places of danger rather than places of natural expansion. That's right. I, I, rather than using the word control, the, the word that I find is the most accurate way to describe what people are looking for, they're looking for care. They want the landscape to show evidence that someone cares. But very briefly, Jen, are people responding positively? When care, signs of care are exerted, there's a broadly positive response or is it, is it apathetic or antagonistic? First of all, let me be clear that the people who live in these cities, many of them work extremely hard, even when uh, public services are not widely available just to ensure that their own properties, or even their own blocks, property they do not own, looks well cared for. That's how much it matters to them. But second of all, as I've traveled the city and taken photographs, people ask me what I'm doing. And when I, when I explain that I'm looking for signs of care, they're so delighted that someone recognizes the uh, fundamental value that has for them and how hard people work to achieve that value uh, in a very impoverished city. Franz, I wonder how, how you respond to this, because in a way you could say that urban rewilding uh, of the kind that Joan has, has articulated so eloquently, in a way is a kind of both a test site for what you're trying to do uh, it, it, uh, rurally, but also it's crucial to that kind of social momentum. That in other words, if you can make it work in towns and cities, there might be a broader um, desire to make it happen all over the world. I is that right? I think so, and um, it's about coexistence. If we become, let's say, pristine landscape protectors, which excludes people, that won't work. George, one of the keystones to, to your argument, but rewilding in general, is, is you know, returning species, and that all of them have value. But of course, Human beings have a hierarchy, and you can understand why people in a city wouldn't necessarily give the same value to rats and cockroaches, or even to deer, beautiful as they are, who might have Lyme disease and so on. Do you still subscribe to the view that even in a, an urban context, we have to be purist about this, and that all species have equal value? Oh, no, I, I don't think I would ever argue that, as far as human beings are concerned, all species have equal value. I mean, I think we, we are a bit... But to let an ecosystem flourish, that oh, has to well, well, oh, well, as as much as possible within the urban context, of, of course, I would love to see that happen. But, you know, as German pointed out, there are compromises which have to be struck. But in general, particularly children benefit from wild places wherever they are. Uh, there's some work suggesting that the more time children spend outdoors in wild or wildish places, the better they do at school because they're learning all these skills of observation and reasoning, of discovery, which are tremendously useful in lots of different contexts for them. Would, would the mother of, of deprived children in Detroit take that same view, do you think, Joan? I mean, the idea of letting children run wild in the street in, in cities is, is a contentious issue. I think um, a mother of a child in Detroit, and, and actually per perhaps more likely a grandmother uh, who remembered Detroit at a different time, um, would take that same view. Um, an example, uh, it, a lot of it, this is context dependent, it is also scale dependent. Mm. And the larger the parcel that is set aside for areas that look natural and can function as being natural, the more likely it is to... Uh, survive and be taken care of in an urban area. And, and an example is the 
famous uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Park in Detroit uh, called Belle Isle. It is an island that's reached by a bridge from the city. And when you talk to grandmothers and grandfathers in Detroit, they remember spending so many happy times on Belle Isle. Uh, an issue, however, for the city in the last 20 years, two of them are safe passage from where I live in my neighborhood that isn't safe or doesn't feel safe anymore to get to Belle Isle. And a second is even places like Belle Isle that look natural and in many ways function as a natural habitat require maintenance. So Belle Isle for a long time did not have adequate maintenance and the neighborhoods were not safe for safe passage. Um, for various reasons, I think that's being turned around in Detroit in the last year. And uh, so some of these grandmothers who remember their baseline uh, is <laughs> Detroit, where you could get on a streetcar and go to a wild place with your friends, just kids, and enjoy this wild place together. But do you, do you sense still in the short term a kind of resentment that people are being asked to care for or accept landscapes uh, or the creation of certain areas or the maintenance of certain areas in cities when actually there are economic and social problems? People who I know who live in Detroit today are idealistic about the future of Detroit. I mean, it, the population is less than half of what it was um, 40 years ago. So people who are there, at least those people who I talk with, are committed. They are willing to do what they're physically able to do, what they have the resources to do, to make their neighborhood and their city uh, a desirable place. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't wish that they have had an operating street light on their street and that they aren't deeply disappointed if police and fire services are inadequate. Very briefly, I want to ask each of the three of you to end by just looking 20 years down the line and to suggest how successful you think the idea of rewilding will be. Not how much you hope, but what you actually think is, is likely. Franz, I'm quite positive and uh, expect that we have a few cases in Europe where we've learned how wild nature could function in a European context, which are very inspiring for others to, to learn from it and to uh, adapt some of these ideas. Joan? I think that in the next 20 or 30 years, the driver of climate change will make the rewilding idea even more relevant that we will need to think about the landscapes that we've thought about for cultivation or even urbanization in very different ways in a short time frame. And so thinking about landscape change and how habitat is part of that will be driven to have to do that. And George? I think in Britain we will have seen by then more or less the first large carnivore introductions, probably lynx. In, on, on the continent of Europe, I think we'll be beginning a new conversation where, um, if it's true that by then roughly 30 million hectares of land, an area the size of Poland, will have been abandoned by farmers, we might then be talking about reintroducing some creatures we haven't talked about so far in this programme, which used to live in Europe. Elephants, rhinos, hippos, lions, hyenas, have some European Serengetis. On that sublime and serene note, <laughs> and slightly surreal note, we must end. <laughs> Thanks very much to all three of you, George Monbiot, Joan Nassau and Franz Scapers. Next week, aliens. What makes some people believe in extraterrestrial beings and not others? And what really lies behind the stories of alien abduction or alien invasion? Till then, though, from me and all of us here at the Forum, have a good week. And for our usual bird song to end the programme, we have the Little Egret, which is a summer visitor to the Danube Delta in Romania, one of those areas designated for rewilding Europe, but it was actually recorded in the wetlands of the Camargue in France. Goodbye.